This building may not be very familiar to you, but I'm sure that the magazines we make inside are. This is the home of Future Publishing, Europe's biggest publisher of computers magazines. My name's Steve Jarrett, and I'm the editor of one of those magazines, perhaps the best known of all, Amiga Format. Before we get down to business, perhaps you'd like to take a look inside. These are the offices of the biggest, best, and most famous Amiga magazine, Amiga Format. And here are a few of the people who work long and hard to bring you the most read Amiga magazine on the newsstands. Behind me is Sue White, Amiga Format's art editor. She's responsible for making sure the magazine looks as good as it does. This is Richard Jones. He's our production editor. He reads everything we write, takes out all the spelling mistakes, and makes sure it's fit to print. And this is Nick Veach, consultant editor and Amiga Format's resident technical expert. Anyway, let's leave them to get on with their work. Let's go to my desk. The Amiga has long been recognized as the best home computer for the video enthusiast. With its range of software and hardware, and the graphics capabilities of the machine itself, many professional sequences have been created with the aid of the world's favorite home computer. This video shows you how you can start out in the exciting arena of DTV with little more than an Amiga and a video recorder. Now, over to our video expert. I hope you find these tutorials useful and interesting. Hello there and welcome to the rather surreal idea of a video about video. As soon as we get started properly, we'll be showing you how you can do things with an Amiga that make your home videos look pretty much like the programs on TV. Incidentally, before we start, I just should mention that the picture quality here isn't quite what we'd normally bring you, because the whole thing's running through this 150 pound Amiga Genlock, but we think you'll agree it's not too bad. What this Genlock allows us to do is add titles at the start of a video to introduce it, add credits at the end to give mention to anyone who's helped out, and even put captions on any picture you want them to. All this will be no problem at all for you to do with just an Amiga and a simple video setup, and you might also want to try a hand at something rather more complicated, like special effects or animation. That's better. One little problem we might need to deal with before we start off, though, is that you might not have a very clear idea of what the phrase desktop video actually means. To be honest, that's because it doesn't really mean an awful lot. When the phrase desktop publishing started getting popular to describe using a computer to design magazines, people started calling any video process that involved a computer desktop video. The difference is that with desktop publishing, you can completely do away with all the traditional processes. Instead, typesetting and laying out your magazine, complete with pictures, entirely on the screen. Desktop video, on the other hand, is not radically different from video without computers. The main processes are still shooting your footage and then editing it. You might be aware that Hollywood filmmakers actually cut out the bits of film they want and glue them together, leaving the unwanted pieces lying on the cutting room floor. But editing video is rather different. The only way to edit videotape is to play your footage on one video recorder or even your camcorder, which is called your source, and record just the bits you want onto a second video recorder, which holds your master tape. A computer isn't really a big help in a process as simple as that, and video editing is pretty much a computer-free zone, though I have to admit that's not quite the whole truth. The video industry is now switching in a big way to digital editing systems run entirely on computers, where the video footage is digitized into the computer and stored on a massive hard drive. Using the editing software, the operator can then simply drag clips of footage into the sequence wherever he wants them, and mess with the audio, then dump the whole finished sequence to the master tape. That sort of thing is currently rather too advanced for the Amiga, but there is actually a way you can give your Amiga a role in the editing process. Let's just explain a bit about how home editing works. The simplest way to edit is set your recording machine on pause, then play the piece you want on your source machine, and just start and stop recording to get the piece you want. That's really all editing is, just choosing the bits of footage you want and recording them. But doing it this way is a bit rough and ready, so it's called crash editing. You'll tend to get gaps each time you start and stop recording, so there is a better way. You can easily pop down to a specialist shop like Techno and buy an editing machine like this one. These range in price hugely, from just over £100 to around 1000 Editing mixers will enable you to add fades from one shot to another, and also to dub sound, 
and even add special effects like whizzing pictures around the screen. But probably the most important thing you want to look for in an editing mixer is the ability to actually control your camcorder and video recorder when they're playing back or recording. To control the VCR or camcorder though, the edit machine has to be able to talk to the video players. So one thing you should bear in mind when you're choosing new equipment is connectability. For example, lots of Sony equipment uses a connection system called LANC, spelt L-A-N-C, which makes them very easy to connect up. And other manufacturers have adopted the same system. Panasonic use their own connection system, and so on. The advantage of having an edit mix that starts and stops both playback and recording is that the edits will be much less noticeable. You may know that television pictures run at 25 frames per second. That's 25 different pictures every second. A good edit controller will mean that your edits only take about three frames to complete, which is not totally perfect, but is not so noticeable as to be intrusive. To get any better, you'd have to be using professional broadcast quality equipment. You can also buy an Amiga package called Video Director, which does the same as an edit machine. It includes hardware to control the LANC equipped player and has a programmable infrared remote control that can operate your recording VCR. And it also has software to help you edit a program easily. It's pretty good, it gives decent results and it only costs about £80. Anyway, the point we were making before we digressed was that the main processes in video production are shooting the footage and editing it, and that desktop video doesn't really help with either. What the computer can do, however, is replace a whole lot of extra gadgetry. To do titles like this, at one time you would have had to buy a dedicated video captions generator, which would have been pretty expensive and yet not half as flexible as a computer, where control over style of lettering and colour is almost unlimited. You could also use graphics programs on a computer to create logos or intro animations, or a sequencer to compose music for your programs. And that's before you even start considering any video special effects you could do with the computer. So while it's not a key part of the video system, a computer can play a major role in video. More than that though, desktop video is about simplicity. The essence of DTV is DIY, you might say. That's because all you need for a basic desktop video setup is stuff you've probably got in your home already. A camcorder with which to shoot the footage, and that also acts as your source machine when you're editing, a VCR to record when you're editing, and an Amiga with software. There's only one extra bit of gadgetry that you won't already have, and that's this thing, a Genlock, which is used to mix together your Amiga's video output and the signal from your videotape. But we'll explain all about Genlocks shortly. The important thing for now is that you can get a decent Genlock for about £150, which means that might be the sum total of your initial investment in a desktop video system. OK, so you should have a reasonable idea of what you're going to need to make your own video programmes. It's pretty much down to a camcorder, a VCR, an Amiga and a Genlock. Right, so your first question might be, is my Amiga good enough? Well, it very probably is, but certain models of Amiga have an advantage over other models when it comes to video work, and we'll just run through what those are. The Amiga 600 and 1200 both have the advantage of an extra type of video output on the back of the machine. This is the composite output, which gives a high-quality signal of a kind that video equipment also uses. You might be aware that the Amiga's RGB video output gives a better quality signal if you're using a monitor. But Amiga RGB is no use at all to video equipment, so having one of these two machines with a composite output makes life a lot easier. And another thing that makes life a lot easier is the newer AGA chipset. The custom chipset that's in the A1200 and A4000 has a slightly different way of handling the colour palette, which means you can genlock into any colour on the screen you wish. The older machines, like the A500 and A600, can only genlock into one colour, the background colour, but we'll explain exactly how genlocking works later on. All in all then, your best choice is probably the A1200, because it has both advantages, the composite output and the new chipset. You'll be better off if you have a hard drive too, but that's about all you need in the way of Amiga hardware. The next thing you need is a camcorder to film your footage with. We thought it might be a good idea to find out more about what you should look for when you're buying a camcorder. And so we popped down to our local Techno store in Cardiff and spoke to Techno's expert, George Francis, about what you should look for when you're buying a camcorder.
Life popped down to the techno store in Cardiff to talk to George Francis, who's from the techno professional department. I've just been looking in the window and there seems to be an enormous range of camcorders on offer. So probably the best place to start is if you just explain the different formats for us. First of all, we start with the VHS format, which is a full-size cassette, it's like domestic machines at home. Um, you've got standard VHS and you've also got super VHS, which is the high resolution VHS format. Okay. Next, you have VHS-C, which is a compact size VHS cassette which then goes into an, an adapter, which can then be played back into a VHS machine at home. Okay. Then you go on to 8mm, which is the smallest sort of the three, but quite a bit of advantage on this is that you've got longer playing time, um, also the audio is much better on 8mm, and there's other differences as well, which, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about later on. Okay. So that's the main three formats at the moment. You were telling me before that when someone comes into the shop, the advice you give them would depend on what they want to use a camcorder for. So could you give us some idea of that? Okay. First of all, um, this is a basic budget camcorder. Very limited override, very limited specification. Um, this is basically for an enthusiast who's not thinking about doing anything special in the future um, in forms of editing, etc. But basically wants a camera, which will give them good picture quality, which is also user-friendly, um, with limited override, the family can use it easily, um, and also very, very good value for money. Okay? Um, on this camera, basically, you've got um, manual exposure on variable shutter speeds, etc. You've got date and time facility. All these overrides are actually programmed exposure, so the customer has naturally got to select the shutter speed or the aperture manually. It's all done for them automatically within the camera itself. On eight, this is an 8mm camera, which will allow you to record up to 90 minutes or even up to 120 minutes in standard play. Um, obviously, that time would be and doubled if you were using the camera in long play. On the camcorder itself as well, you've got full playback facility, um, built-in microphone, um, automatic zoom, and also autofocus. Okay? Um, there's a limited override on this camera compared to something else, which, you know, another one which is a larger specification and also in a different price point, which I'll show you later on. But I would say that this would be a sort of budget camera which I would recommend to an enthusiast who's not thinking about doing any editing in the future. This would cost about £495. What's next up in the range, then? OK, next up in the range, we'll go to a different price point as well as a different format. Uh, this is one of JVC's new palm quarters. Now, this is a different format. This is VHS-C, um, which is the smaller compact size VHS tape, which will allow you to record in standard play for about 45 minutes um, in standard play or 90 minutes in long play. Um, once you've actually finished your actual recording, you then take the tape out of the actual camcorder itself, put it into a cassette adapter, which will allow you to play directly back onto your video recorder at home, your VHS video recorder. Um, main advantage with this is ease of use and also access as well. Um, there's no problems in actually copying down onto VHS because you basically take the tape from the machine into your cassette adapter. You've got instant playback at home. This camera is packed with features as well. Um, to start with, we've got a cinema mode on the side of the camera itself which basically s simulates wide screen. Um, you've got an age function. Um, I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> want to use that to remind themselves. And you've also got focus, which is autofocus as well as manual focus. You've also got automatic exposure as well as full manual exposure. You've got a fade facility, and you've got what we call pick modes. Um, basically, these, the camera itself takes over from the manual control that the individual would normally have to choose. It sets the shutter speed and the aperture dependent on the pick mode that you actually select. So if you select sports, it selects an eye shutter speed. If you select portrait, it works out the exposure for that as well. Um, if you select nighttime mode, it does the same for that as well. The camera will automatically select the appropriate exposure for that situation. Okay? On this, you've also got a 10 time power zoom um, and full playback functions on the top of the camera as well, um, which includes date and time facility standard play and long play recording, and also a selection between an EC30 tape and an EC45 tape as well. 
viewfinder, you've got full playback on the viewfinder itself. It's a black and white viewfinder. Um, image quality and black and white viewfinders are excellent. Um, full recording function on the side of the camera there as well. You've got record start and stop. And battery compartment, which also leads onto the mains unit as well if you want to use the camera at home on the mains without any use of battery. Okay, for 699, I would say that this is probably top in the price point for a VHSC camcorder. Right, so the next one you have there is a top of the range model, is it? Yes. Okay. This is new Sony TR2000 palm quarter. It's a revolutionized camcorder, um, mainly because it's a few functions, for instance, image stabilizing functions optically. Um, which allows you to eliminate anti-shake. Um, also, you've got a lot of manual control on the camcorder compared to the other ones that I've shown you. I mean, for instance, on the side of the camera itself, you've got complete control and manual exposure, so you can open and close the iris on the camera itself. You've got manual as well as automatic focus, um, and also you've got program exposures as well, if you don't want to use the actual manual override. You've also got manual as well as automatic white balance. So if you're going from an outdoor situation to an indoor situation, you can actually select the white balance accordingly. On the other side of the camera itself, you've got date and time facility, counter facility, and most important, you've got time code facility. Could you just explain time code for us, please? Yes, most definitely. Time code is an electronic way of identifying each individual frame that's recorded. There's 25 frames per second. Um, on a recording um, and what the camcorder will do is automatically identify each individual frame with an identity mark okay now this is important when you're actually editing because this will allow the end user to actually edit to a particular frame and actually identify that as being a start or an out point okay this camera has also got a Sony protocol called a LANC terminal now this can be connected to any Sony editor uh, which has got that appropriate LANC terminal or any third party manufacturer, for instance, an armor cut or um, any Videonics or you know, video machine editor which is capable and has got that LANC terminal. Okay? Now, that will allow you to actually utilize the actual time code function on the actual camcorder itself. So when you're actually editing, instead of getting hour, minutes and seconds with no frame recognition, you will actually get hour, minutes, seconds, and frames. So when you're actually queuing the tape backwards or forwards, you can actually queue it to the appropriate frame to edit. So let's just review those points then. The most important features are probably time code, manual focus, and manual exposure. So can you just explain manual focus for us? Manual focus can be very important if you're in a situation where you need to actually focus through glass or anything which has got reflective surface. Now, because of the actual mechanism, the actual focusing mechanism in the camcorders, what happens is if you point the camera directly to um, a subject which is you know, mainly glass or mainly reflective surface, the camera will actually focus on the actual reflection on the glass itself. To eradicate this, you've got a manual focusing mechanism on the camera, which will allow you to eventually point the camera to the subject and focus through the glass or the reflective surface at an infinite point if necessary. The next important function on the camera itself is manual exposure. Now, this is another very important manual override in order to increase and decrease the exposure for an individual subject. Now, let's take an example. If, say, for instance, you were shooting a subject which was against a very large glass door and you had a great amount of sunlight coming in from behind that subject, what would happen is, in normal program exposure, the subject would be silhouetted against the background. Now, in order to actually bring that subject out and also the detail within that subject, you need manual exposure in order to increase the exposure on the subject and bring that subject out against the background. And how much would this top-end model be? This would cost 1299 um, But for 1299 you've got the flexibility of either using the camera in full program, so basically put your tape in, put your battery on, point and shoot, or you've got the flexibility of all the manual overrides on the camera where you can actually select your white balance automatically, select your shutter speed manually, and also open and close the iris at will. Okay? So for £1,299, you've got 
a camera which will do the same as you know, a larger format camera within this sort of size and within this sort of price bracket. What sort of accessories will normally come with a camera? Normally with the camera you'd get an AC unit which is your mains unit which also doubles up as your charger. You would get an RF unit or an appropriate SCART adapter which will allow you to take the audio and video output from the camera into either your television or your video recorder. Um, you'll also get a strap with the camera itself, uh, NICAD battery, instructions obviously, <laughs> um, and also a battery for the date and time facility in order to retain the date and time in the camcorder. Um, last but not least, obviously, microphone which are built into the camera, but you've also got an external microphone facility as well. Could you tell us more about microphones? Um, on the camcorders, the microphones vary dramatically. Um, you can have a fixed microphone on the camera, which will basically pick up um, on the directional sound or the sound around the camera itself. Or you can have a fixed microphone within the camera, but one which also zooms. So when you're in wide angle, it will actually zoom to accommodate for that angle. And also when you're in tele, it will also zoom to accommodate for that as well. And then obviously you've also got the facility to have an external microphone on the camera, which not only allows you to actually separate the microphone and also pick up um, directional sound, but also eradicate wind noise, which is something that's normal on the built-in microphone, which is on the camera itself. With an Amiga and a camcorder, the other main component in your simple home DTV setup is the VCR. And since you probably have a video recorder already, you're less likely to be choosing a new one. Just in case, though, here's a couple of tips. First, remember that connectability. Look out for a LAMP socket or similar controller compatibility that will help you connect to an edit machine. Second, modern forehead VCRs that have perfect freeze frame are bound to give a cleaner edit. And thirdly, a jog shuttle control, which imitates the control system used by professional studio machines, will make it much easier to whiz around your tape. Stereo sound might be nice, and an audio dub facility will give you more options when it comes to putting a soundtrack down. And one last thing that would be an excellent idea is SVHS compatibility, just so long as you have it on your camcorder and your television as well. We haven't explained SVHS yet, so let's just briefly mention what it is. The S stands for Super, and Super VHS is an improved version of the ordinary VHS system, which gives better quality for a couple of reasons. First, it has double the vertical resolution, using 420 lines instead of the normal 250 or so, which makes the picture clearer. Second, it uses a component signal that's split into separate parts for chrominance, which is colour, and luminance, which is brightness and contrast, and that gives better quality than the usual composite signal, which mixes them all up. All of this makes for a better picture, and the SVHS advantages are also shared by the Hi8 system. Right, with an Amiga, a camcorder and a VCR in place, the last and most crucial thing we need is a Genlock. There's at least a dozen of these on the market, and apart from the price, what you're judging them on is how clean the signal they produce is, or in other words, how good the picture looks. There are really cheap Genlocks available, the cheapest being Lola's Mini Gen, which costs about £50. But really, it doesn't give an adequate signal quality. In the middle to high end price bracket, there's models from G2, including the very posh and vastly expensive video centre here, and there's also a range from Harma, which are pretty good. However, when you're starting off, you don't want to spend too much money, and so the Rendale 8802 at £170 is a good choice. And the Rockgen Plus at about £150 is good value too. Either of these two last will do you nicely, but we just happen to have a Rendale to hand, so we've used that. You might also look out for the G-Lock model, which has the advantage of being controlled completely from software, so it doesn't actually have any knobs or sliders on it. That means you could write AREX control scripts to do all your fades and wipes, but that's a bit complex for my liking. To connect up the Genlock, all we have to do is feed it our Amiga output from here, most Genlocks use the Amiga RGB output, and then feed it our video output in here, so it can mix the two together. Then we just take the mix signal it produces, out of here to our video recorder. So it's just simply a matter of plugging in a few cables. And with the Genlock in place, we have our complete desktop video setup. Camcorder, video recorder, Amiga, and Genlock. Now let's see what the Genlock can do. The 
The thing you love about Genlocks is how simple it all is. Once you've got your Genlock, you can lock your video picture into any single colour on the Amiga screen. Just to show you how that works, here we go with locking our picture into the workbench screen. If you've ever seen the chart show on ITV, incidentally, this is exactly what they do. They put all their messages into little windows on a colourful workbench screen and then genlock their music videos into the whole lot. Easy, eh? A paint programme like Personal Paint or Deluxe Paint is probably a better idea, though, and you're bound to have one or the other. So try loading it up now and typing something on the screen. Remember that you can change the font you want to use, and if you have any colour fonts, you can also use those. You can also change the colour of the type on the screen. And if you want to, you can pick up your type as a brush position it anywhere around the screen. You can also, if you wish, resize the type. Then all you have to do is mix in your titles of your videotape picture using the Genlock and you're ready. You might also want to hide the menu bars. It's also simple that even the cat could use it. There's two other things you might want to watch out for too. First, your best bet is to use an interlaced screen mode which works the same way as a TV screen. We've said the TV pictures run at 25 frames a second, but they actually refresh the screen 50 times a second. It's just that they only do half of the screen each time. The two halves knit together and go to make up one whole frame, which is what interlace means. Because a TV uses an interlace screen, if you do the titles in interlace screen mode, they will look better. And you can tell interlaced modes on the Amiga by the way they flicker. The other thing you should watch out for is using saturated shades of red and blue, which VHS tape doesn't like at all. It bleeds them all over the place. If you are using red or blue, then be careful to take a lot of colour out of them until they look unreasonably dark on the Amiga. That way, there's a reasonable chance that they'll look okay when they finally reach videotape. The best colour to use for captions is probably a nice simple white We'll put a black outline around it. You can put an outline on lettering by simply picking it up as a brush and then choosing the outline option for the menu. Or in this case, I can just do it by pressing O on the keyboard. It's pretty much the same in either deluxe paint or personal paint. White text with a black outline is what they tend to use in subtitling films, for example, because it's simple but effective. If in doubt, make your lettering larger rather than smaller because there's no point having titles that people can't read on the screen. But do bear in mind that you don't want to cover up faces and perhaps make allowances for this when filming. One other thing you could do is put titles on a coloured bar, though again, watch out for those reds and blues that VHS tape doesn't like. This can look pretty professional when you genlock it in, and if you plan for it when filming, you could even do these titles vertically down the side of the screen, for example. Let's just look at a couple of other ideas that you can create with a paint package in the genlock. Here, for example, we have the idea of titles down the side of the screen. You could prepare a border or background with an area of solid colour to genlock into, and then genlock into that. At this point, I could also hit the colour cycling in deluxe paint to get some really psychedelic effects. You could also freehand draw over anything you want, as well as add nice, friendly, handwritten captions. Though unless you're good at using a mouse, they might look rather childish. You could even stick a moustache on somebody this way. And now you see that with the video picture locked in. Highly amusing, I don't think. Remember also that Deluxe Paint has animation, and just think about what you could use that for. Longing titles should be easy, but if you also remember that any area in your key colour will have video picture in, and all other areas won't, I dare say you could come up with some pretty interesting dissolve effects too. Remember that if you have an older Amiga, you can only key into one colour on the Amiga screen, and that's what's called colour zero, the very first colour in the Amiga's system palette. The good news, however, is that if you change the palette, then colour zero also changes, and in actual fact, colour zero is whichever colour you're using as the background colour. So that shouldn't give you any problems at all. So click with the right-hand mouse button rather than the left. That's really all you need to know about titling, and in fact, we're well into the arena of special effects. The more you think about it, the more you should be able to see creative ways in which to use a paint package with the Genlock. But we'll have to leave you to experiment with that for yourself. 
We've just got time before we move on to take a look at a few dedicated titling packages which you might prefer to use instead of a paint package. The main advantages they have are threefold. Moving titles is generally quicker and easier to do. Effects to start and end your titles are often programmed in and a range of different fonts and typefaces are usually supplied free with the package. There's quite a few older packages around that you might pick up cheap of which one of the best is something called TV Text Professional, a pretty straightforward scrolling titler with lots of fonts. Electronic Arts' deluxe video is probably not a good option because it does so many different things that it's rather too complex, which also goes for Goldisk's Showmaker. ZVP's Video Studio includes interesting extras like a time clock and colour bars, but it's very, very old. You're better off looking for a nice, simple, straightforward titler. The big alternative scroller only costs £20 and was created by a video company who are active in Amiga Video. It simply produces scrolling text, which is nice and easy. Rollum is like a flashier version of the same thing, and it isn't too bad. But really, the best bet would have to be a program called Scala. Scala is very easy to use and comes with lots of really attractive typefaces and loads of nice clip art. The best of all, there's a version of it designed especially for home video use called Scala HVT, which stands for Home Video Titler. It costs only £49 and would definitely be our recommendation. So there we go. Remember, you can use your paint package for titling, but animated moving titles might be rather more tricky, or you can choose a dedicated titling program. Either way, it's a good idea to become a collector of fonts so that you have a nice wide choice of lettering, and there's a lot of good fonts available in the public domain. We've seen how you can use a Genlock for titling, but now let's take a quick look at wipes and fades. The Rendale Genlock we're using has just one knob on it and also a number of switches. When I have it switched to foreground, the knob will fade in the Amiga image Genlocked over the video. If, however, I switch to Amiga only, the fader can now be used to fade in the Amiga picture completely over the video image. A more sophisticated Genlock might have sliders to help you fade the mixed picture to black or from black, and it might also have some special transitions and wipes built in to help you move from one picture to another. Alternatively, you might find that buying an edit controller with effects built in is a good idea. Just briefly, let's cover what the terms mean. A fade is generally just to black and perhaps back again. A dissolve tends to be a slow blend from one picture to another. And a wipe is a fast moving change from one picture to another. You'll also find that a mixer might have some clever things programmed in, like a multiple picture mode, which is all a bit much, really. One thing that you might find helps you imitate some of the flashiest effects is to get a video digitizer which you can use to capture a static image from your video. You can then go to town on it in a paint package, doing anything from zooming it in so it pixelizes and looks all blocky, to wrapping it around a ball and bouncing it off the screen. It's all rather silly, really, but it could be effective if you want to show off a little. That's all very much up to you, but I would advise you to use fancy dissolves and wipes as little as possible. Right, we've got something new to look at now, and that's the very clever idea of chroma keying. Whereas a Genlock mixes a video picture into a flat area of colour on the Amiga screen, a chroma key does pretty much the opposite. Get a video picture with a flat area of colour and you can mix in Amiga graphics or even a completely different video picture. It's the famous technique that's used to make Superman appear to fly over New York or to put Michael Fish on top of the weather map. All you have to do is stand your weatherman in front of a blue screen and then chroma key the picture of the map into the solid blue colour. You might think it needs expensive equipment to do this, but it's not so. Incidentally, the reason I was wearing a completely different shirt in that last shot is because this colour is far too close to the background colour we were using and I'd have had a weather map all over my shirt. Right, the gadget we've got here is Roctet's chroma key device for the Amiga, which costs only about £150. You can use this to key Amiga graphics into either a flat area of colour or, as we've described, you can key the Amiga screen into an area of a certain brightness, which is called luminance keying. I can't really show you how to use it because it's just as simple as the Genlock. All you have to do is hook up to the right cables on the back and start using it. 
The important thing for now is knowing it's there for you to use if you fancy trying it, and that it's really not difficult to use at all. The next thing we really need to cover is sound. Audio dubbing is probably one of the most difficult things in the world to do, because getting words to match up with the movements of someone's mouth, or lip syncing as they call it in the trade, looks terrible unless it's exactly right. For that reason, you want to record sound with all footage where you can see someone talking and stick with it. You can, however, pretty easily add voiceovers to almost any sequence you want to, which is probably most easily used for comic effect. You can also add music in a fairly straightforward process. Most edit controllers also include something like a four-channel audio mixer, but you can pop out and buy one separately for only 30 or 40 pounds if you wish. What this then enables you to do is to load the sound from up to four different sources into the box, including the sound from your original tape, and then feed the mix sound out to your recording machine so that the mix of all four is what ends up on your master tape. You can use a CD player or hi-fi as a source for music this way and add whatever music you like. If you're worried about copyright, don't worry too much as long as you're only making videos for the family to watch. Madonna's lawyers aren't too likely to phone up if you use a snatch of her on something that only your nearest and dearest are going to see. But for any video that's going to be used for anything that might be construed as a public performance, you want to track down some copyright-free music. CDs of copyright-free stuff are now quite widely available, and you've probably got one very like this with your video order. If you're truly keen on producing an Amiga-based video, you could also create your own music on the Amiga with something like the Music X program that was on the cover of issue 58 of Amiga format. It's actually much easier to do than you might imagine. One final thing to note about audio is that mixing the right amount of bass and treble into it is very important, and you can do this with a simple mixer too. Voices particularly are hard to get right, but a little effort pays off vastly in making your videos easier to follow. The basic pattern of most films, TV programs and videos is pretty straightforward. Title sequence at the start, program in the middle, credits at the end. And of course your Amiga and Genlock will help you with the titles and the end credits. No mysteries there. If you're just editing together your holiday footage or a wedding video, then you should find it pretty straightforward because you'll have shot the footage in a linear way, and so you can simply put it together in order, in which case the linear time structure holds it all together. You could also add captions to reinforce the sense of events happening in a particular order. If you're trying to shoot a scripted piece from scratch, however, you'll need to take a little more care. First, start not with a whole script, but with an outline, a synopsis of what you want in the script. When you're happy with that, you can move on to the finished script. When you type your script up, you should leave plenty of room for notes, and you should also attempt to describe each shot, even if you just use the vague terms wide, medium, and close-up. Naturally, you can film spontaneous things that happen on the day, but generally, you should know exactly what each shot will look like before you even do it. Also, shoot extra close-ups that you can cut in afterwards to help fill in awkward jump cuts or gaps. Before you film, prepare your equipment, paying particular attention to cleaning the camcorder lens with the correct cleaning cloths or brushes, and cleaning the heads with a head cleaner tape. Always use a fresh, new tape when you film. An old tape might be fine for recording last night's Bond movie, but if you get glitches on your source footage, you'll really notice it later on. And always buy the most expensive grade of tape you can afford, because it really does make a difference. Remember that later this tape will be copied several times, at least for the master and then for the copies, and the picture quality will degrade each time. So the better it starts off, the better the finished result will be. There's generally one more thing you'll need to do before you start filming, and that's set a white balance on your camcorder. To do this, you simply have to hold a white sheet of card in front of the camcorder lens, like this. Then you press the white balance on your camcorder. It will set the exposure so that it knows that this is what white looks like under these light conditions, and it should then get all the other colours right too. There's a few other things you ought to bear in mind about lighting too. Strangely, artificial light can make the lighting look more natural. If we just flick this light off behind me, and then flick it back on again, you'll see that it can look like a sort of window effect. Also, be very careful of continuity of light. A picture of a building in the morning will look very different from the same thing in the evening. 
and an artificial light moved even slightly can change the look of a whole shot. Another thing to bear in mind is don't try to film in too little light. Your camera might do surprisingly well, but the picture is very likely to become grainy. And one last thing to watch out for is continuity. If we cut away now to a completely different picture, you might imagine that this would distract you altogether. But in fact, when we cut back and something's changed, you notice something's wrong even before you realise exactly what it is. Of course, it's this plant that suddenly appeared. Last of all, remember not to overuse those fancy effects. Right, so hopefully we've given you some pointers on where to start with desktop video. I'm afraid that's all we have time for on this tape, but I'm sure there's more than enough there for you to try your hand at least at genlocking and get some pretty exciting results. Just before you go, we've asked Tony Racine of Microdeal to demonstrate a completely new kind of Amiga video package for us. So over to Tony. I'd like to show you a low-cost device which you can use to add extra sparkle to your home videos without spending a fortune. VideoMaster is a video digitizer which plugs into the expansion port of any Commodore A500, 600 or 1200 computer. Basically, the package is a clever hardware device which allows you to record still or moving images with sampled sound into your computer. The software which supports this will allow you to take your video and audio, add imported color graphics and edit them all together using a simple sequencing system. The hardware takes the form of two units. The first, the Video Master Digitizer, allows me to sample a mono or stereo soundtrack to digitize full screen stills and to record high speed sequences of real video into the computer's memory. All I need is to feed a composite video signal into the Video Master's input socket. This can be from practically any video source, but I'm using an ordinary VHS video recorder. The second optional device is called Color Master. As its name suggests, this device will allow us to digitize full screen stills in glorious color. I'm going to use the software now to show you how Video Master may add a light-hearted opening sequence to a home video. The theme is angling, and I've already prepared a number of pre-recorded sections of video. I've also edited some color graphics screens from a paint package, such as Deluxe Paint, to provide text for the opening credits. The sequence will both start and end with a short pause to allow me to start and stop the video recorder before and after the sequence. At this stage, much of the work has already been done. I'm now going to finish off a few bits before we can create our final sequence. First of all, I'm going to use Video Master and Color Master together to digitize a color logo and import this into one of the opening sequences. First, you have to queue up your videotape to the point you want to digitize. And then, pause it so you've got a good static screen. Then you simply ask Video Master to scan the picture into the computer. It digitizes the red, green and blue signals separately and then the computer combines them to generate a full color picture. Once we've done this and the image has been saved to disk, we can then import the image into one of the frames of a pre-recorded video sequence. The next thing we want to do is to digitize some video footage into the computer. This is very easy. All we have to do is play the videotape and click on record from within the software. Once we have the video clip in the machine, we can then use facilities within the software to crop off the start and end. Now we can save the results back to disk once again. Next we're going to add some music. All we have to do is plug the CD player into the Video Master cartridge, then select the sound sampling and editing screen. Again, all you have to do is press play on the CD player and record on the screen. And you can now digitize a piece of music. This can be of any length to see it's your final video sequence.
As we did with the video, we can also crop whichever bits of sound we don't require. And we can also add extra effects such as fade in and fade out at the start and end of the sample. Once again, we'll save this to disk. Here's what the sound sounds like. Now that we have all of the ingredients, we can edit the new pieces into our opening sequence. This is the Video Master Sequencer. In the top left hand corner, we have the familiar video display with our soundtrack along the bottom of the screen. This display in the centre is where our sequence will appear and the buttons to the right are effectively where our sections of video or stills are stored. Each video clip or still may have a piece of audio attached to it and each one is assigned to a different key on the keyboard. To record our sequence all we have to do is hit record and then punch the keys on the keyboard to trigger each segment of the video when required. When you've finished recording, you can play back your sequence, but for the final version that you want to put on your working videotape, you won't want to see all of the Video Master gadgetry. What you do is use the VidiPlay software provided with the package to turn your finished sequence into a standalone video production. And you can either have it played at quarter screen, as before, or at the full size, or with a picture-in-picture -picture mode you can have it big and small at the same time. And that's it. You can find out more about Video Master by telephoning Microdeal on 0525 718181. Thanks very much to Tony Racine and to Microdeal. And I'm sure you can see some interesting ways in which the idea could be used creatively in your video productions. All that remains to say is the best of luck with your own videos and happy shooting. We've produced this series of videos as part of our commitment to you, our readers. If you have any suggestions on how we should improve the videos or the magazine itself, please write to me, Steve Jarrett, at the address at the end of this video. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again soon. Additional videos in the Amiga format range include Personal Paint, an introduction to the A1200, A1200 hard drives, upgrading your machine, Music X, Multimedia, Desktop Video Volume 1, Desktop Video Volume 2, and finally the Amiga format going to Clarissa. Priced at just $14.99 each, or any three for $34.95, they represent excellent value for money. For further details, contact BVG at the address given at the end of this video.